Chinese city, 500 miles from the front. City of Shanghai, 20,000 killed. Nanking in ruins, 10,000 dead. Hankow, 15,000. Canton, 20,000. All civilians, not one soldier. 150,000 dead. becomes your enemy. The walls of your own home become a death trap. They leave the captured cities and move toward the west.
are going toward the interior, men, women, and animals. Toward the west, toward the old land, the interior of China. Here are the graves of the old kings, lying silent under the fields of wheat. On this earth live generations of men. They invented the iron plow and paper made of the fibers of rice. They wrote poems and erected beautiful cities. And China was the flower of the world. Out of the mountain stone, men carved out lions to stand above the sacred graves. The great lions of China, looking in the four directions of the wind. There were wise men that spoke in those days, Confucius, Lo Tzu, scholars, artists who could paint the wind, and emperors taller than any man. And stone eyes that see forever. Toward the land of China, there was a single road from the west. Marco Polo came by this route from Italy, and he returned with his camels loaded with tea, jewels, gunpowder, medicines, carvings of precious jade, paintings made on silk, and handfuls of rice. He described the fertile rivers and the towers that he saw in every village, called pagodas, that were built to ward off famine and pestilence and war. Always millions of quiet men turning the earth over and over. Wheat in the northwest, Rice in the rich waters of the south. The two rivers, the Yellow and the Yangtze, long generations of hard work, the earth, the wind, and the water, the enormous, the living China. Yellow storm, dust carried by northern winds. The Great Wall sinks down under the dust. China sinks down. She is robbed by Japan and by the Western powers without resistance.
But China begins to shake off the dust of the last century. A new voice arises out of the movement of the people. Dr. Sun Yat-sen. In his room at this desk, he worked out the ideas which would regain China's independence and freedom. At his death in 1924, he became a national hero. 1911, Sun Yat-sen explaining his three great principles. He himself realized it would be many years before his ideals found root among the people, years of quarreling and even civil war. The citizens of China began by ending the misrule of an emperor. And then they took another step toward democracy, learning to read. The sign says, this school is built in the name of Sun Yat-sen. In these schools, a new generation was being trained. Young China learned to cope with science, medicine, economics. Co-eds on the campus, just as in America. Engineers and bridge builders, linking up towns and cities. Western mountains were another hindrance to the development of China. They broke through this barrier to permit commerce with the nations further west, with Russia, Turkestan, Mongolia. The road was built into the northwest. 2,000 miles long. Fortunately, they constructed it well. Today, it is their lifeline, along which supply trucks can speed into the heart of China. There was a time when there was little need of roads. Each village could support itself from the land which surrounded it. But when modern cities arose, the ancient trails were no longer enough. They had to build long, hard surface highways. 13,000 miles in every province of China. Irrigation is an old Chinese art, for the dry soil of China had always to be softened with water. A new type, a Chinese engineer. sound is heard in far provinces. Locomotives rushing through the night. 9,000 miles of steel rails. Airplanes roaring over fields and mountains in great curves. Thus China begins to change herself into a modern nation. Steel, coal, cotton. This growth of independent Chinese industry provoked alarm across the Yellow Sea. Here a clique of warlords ruled 60 million Japanese. The people living on this cluster of islands were no different than the Chinese. They had the same desires as the Chinese. Food, work, peace. But their rulers had different plans. Formosa, 1895 the beginning of Japan's divine mission. Step by step, China, the Philippines next, the Soviet Union, 
California, perhaps the whole world. Korea, 1910. In Japan, more guns, more shells, more taxes. Manchuria seized in 1931. Arms piling up in Japan. Planes, bombs. Listen to the generals meeting in Tokyo. This is the hour to advance before the Chinese grow too strong. The emperor has given his divine approval. The navy and army with invincible force will capture the coastal cities. The radio will explain everything to the foreigners. If the Chinese cowards resist, we blow up their cities. Long live the Imperial Army. Long live DJ, the DJ. Radio Tokyo calling. Radio Tokyo calling. Good evening, friends in America. Once again, we bring you our daily news broadcast. We have received many polite letters from America asking why our divine emperor sends our soldiers and sailors to visit in China. The reply is simple. Our cruisers are steaming up the Yangtze River on a mission of peace. The Chinese women welcomed our Japanese army with flowers, many beautiful flowers. This isn't Tokyo or some port in Italy or Germany. It's San Francisco. This iron will fall on a Chinese city. The United States ships 54% of war materials that go to Japan. Scrap iron, broken machinery are melted down in Tokyo and those shells will go into Japanese guns. The Japanese generals have taken enough. Their warships are on our rivers. They rob our factories, our crops. They kill everyone. Will there never be an end? Yes, it is true. We must endure the years of a hard war. That's why we must forget our old differences. Why should we fight one another? We must defend ourselves against aggression. We must unite. Then we can win. the flag of the Chinese Republic. One-fifth of mankind under one flag. Actors leave their theaters and play on the street corners. They instruct the audience how to resist the enemy. The campaign to raise money touches every man, woman, and child in the country. The money will buy food, guns, hospitals. It's a fine thing to have your name written down in this book of contributions.
In the old days, people said, do not use good iron for nails or good sons for soldiers. In these times, the best sons become soldiers. The tomb of China's unknown soldier is dedicated. He died in defense of Shanghai. He has no name. His name is courage, freedom. Here is Ko Mai Yo, famous poet and historian. This is the chief of staff of the Chinese army, General Chen Cheng. They salute the Washington of their republic, Sun Yat-sen. salute this unknown son of their republic. Madam Chiang Kai-shek, the most famous woman in her country. She organizes the women for defense. There's money to be raised, nurses to be trained, refugees to be fed and housed, and this committee must guide thousands of other committees throughout China. This bank draft has come 6,000 miles. A foreign flag invades New York, but look, money is thrown on the flag. Americans still believe in the rights of the people, in New York or in China. And the flag comes home again, with money to buy rice for the orphans of this tragic war. Months ago, their parents were killed or lost somewhere along the road. There are thousands of such children in China. Here is the youth, facing a difficult future. 
marching under the banners of Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek. The spirit of the nation is typified by this brave woman, the widow of Dr. Sun Yat-sen. The nation grows stronger. The people see clearly that to defeat Japan, they must not only have the spirit and the will to resist, but also guns and soldiers. People's Movement grows the National People's Council. For the first time, the delegates meet. General Chiang Kai-shek, the Christian general, Dr. Kung, Minister of Finance, delegates from the far northwest. Before the meetings, they repeat the three principles of Sun Yat-sen, namely, national independence, freedom and democracy, the well-being of the people. This People's Council strengthens the government. The Executive Cabinet meets. The Minister of Foreign Affairs reports on the possibility of loans from America and England. The Minister of War reports. The invasion blockades the seacoast. China must have more extensive roads. Hard roads need good footwear, and this is manufactured in home industries which are set up in the interior. In this way, the people of the most distant villages are involved in the defense of China. equipment improves, and the training of soldiers improves. These recruits never saw a map before. Up to now, they knew only their own village. There were fields around it, and that was all. Black lines indicate armies already in the field. Follow a line to the northwest, and you come to the 8th Root Army. Here, the leaders of the Special Administrative District hold a military conference. The 8th Root Army, formerly the Chinese Red Army, has been incorporated into the national forces which are fighting the Japanese. It is especially in this northwest region that they employ the new guerrilla tactics, quick attacks, quick retreats, cutting the enemy's railroads and communication lines, cutting off their supplies, attacking suddenly from the rear. The man who leads the 8th Root Army is Chu Tei. He is a general whose headquarters are on the field of battle. Millions of Chinese farmers are behind these enemy lines. They are being armed for surprise attacks, for guerrilla warfare.
This military post can call on thousands of volunteers from the fields. Tell all volunteers to meet on the highway near the Sinkyong River. Soon they will all have rifles. Recruits come in by tens of thousands. Mohammedans, Mongolians, Cantonese. Boys from the rice fields, men from the cold northwest. Recruits must be taught to be good soldiers. Every life counts now. The old shadow dance is converted into a setting up exercise. Now the soldiers have modern rifles. Soldiers must be taught to use these new war machines. They look like football players, but this is a game for the life of their country. fighting for, not for the glory of a little group of warlords, as do the Japanese. They prepare to fight a war of defense, defense for their rivers, their harvests, and their own families. China gets back her sky. The nerve center of armed China is this National Military Council. It has placed all the armies in the field under a united command at last. The chief responsibility rests on the Commander-in-Chief, General Chiang Kai-shek. The new strategy of defense has worked out. China will reserve her heavy equipment for decisive blows. Japan wants to win the war with one glorious battle but China harasses her with a thousand small engagements, knowing that every Japanese advance brings China closer to its ultimate victory.
the invaders had already seized the cities of the coast. While China's defense was being organized, the Japanese advanced deep into Shanxi, Hunan, Guangdong, and along the Yangtze River to Hankou. The Chinese strategy is to avoid major battles, but to block the ends of the enemy advance. Behind the Japanese, small groups of armed peasants cut the lines and then go back into hiding. The Japanese lines of communication are cut again. Japanese munition trains are lost. Bridges disappear. Outposts of Japanese troops are cut off. That is guerrilla warfare. The Japanese control the railroads and the cities, but little else. The banks of the Yellow River are too vast to be wholly occupied by the enemy. This place is one of the vulnerable points of the Japanese lines. A fisherman prepares his goatskin raft. And then regular soldiers, operating by guerrilla methods, emerge from a neighboring village. Meanwhile, a critical situation developed around the town of Taya Chuang. The Japanese had advanced too fast, and the Chinese proposed to surround them. The story of Taya Chuang was told by an officer from the 91st Division. Sergeant Wang, a brave, courteous man, he told what happened and how they fought, sometimes in the heat of the afternoon, sometimes at night. Wang knew how many were wounded, and some of their names, and what provinces they had traveled from. It was our victory, he said, a hard victory. Our guns were covered with dust. It was very early in the morning. We felt strong. We were going to attack. I myself, said Wang, come from Guangxi, where we plant our rice in the mud. Here in the north, they grow millet. The dust blows everywhere. And the sun is often cold. Yet this is also my country. kept marching toward the north, and people told us, be careful, the enemy is not far away, because here the villages were bombed and there was no more grain. The Japanese captain forced these people to carry ammunition, but then he had to retreat. This peasant told me about it. 
The captain ordered the people to gather on a road and threw a thing with a tail like a fish. This man escaped the explosion with the wound in the muscle of his neck. After three hours, we came to the village of Chisin. We heard that the Japanese were retreating. That was true, for I saw the dead in the village. There was nothing left alive. Where they cannot conquer, they kill. That is their custom. Once, this town held 2,000 families. But the Japanese battalions were gone, and the bravest people were coming back. Li Po was the first man. He brought his family with him. The first thing he did was look for his good stone hammer, but his wife searched for the grinding stones, hoping they were not broken by the bombs. While we were marching near the canal, the Japanese tried to find our route. When we lie down, we cast no shadow. And from the sky, we're invisible, the same color as the dust. We had men with us from the Big Sword Battalion and also many machine guns. We were a good division all young men, and we had officers who had fought the Japanese before. Field headquarters were set up near a barn. The plan of attack was to pretend to strike at the front, but to hit hardest at the sides. General Sun directed us. He was a tireless man, placed in command here because he loved to attack. He was an old time general, a fighter all his life. He ordered emplacements of the light artillery. wrapped in cloth so it would not shine back toward the enemy. Battery number seven reporting by field telephone. Correction for battery number seven. 
increase range to 2,000 yards. I think, said Sergeant Wong, we're learning to talk back to the Emperor of Japan. From the north, the wounded were returning. It was 40 miles to the base hospital. While we advanced in front, daring men climbed the stone hills near the mountain of the sacred tree. They went around the back of the mountain. And they planned to surprise the Japanese from behind. Our scouts watched from the mountain, very quiet. A Japanese patrol on the road, along the Japanese line of communication. They saw our men, but it was too late. While this was happening, we advanced along the Grand Canal into the edge of the town. It was quiet now, not much firing except far off at the right. A machine gun nested our flank. It was left there to protect the enemy retreat. cover in the trenches used last night by the 31st Division. A squad of our men blew up the enemy nest. The way was clear. The division in front of us had occupied Tyre Schwung during the night. I saw the flag on the walls. We had taken back Tyre Schwung. We captured nine Japanese tanks. sunset, we fortified the gate against counterattack. Tai Chuang was ours. That was our victory, said Sergeant Wong. We buried the dead and rested in that city. When the Japanese general staff learned of their loss at Tai Chuang, they struck back. They took revenge for their defeat. 
They bombed the open cities of China. They bombed the unarmed population. These are not easy things to look at, but as Americans, we had to see them. We saw the building and the destruction, the suffering and the hope of victory. Tire Chuang is taken. The Chinese will march all night in the streets to celebrate their first victory. Here is a great people, one-fifth of the human race, fighting in defense of their freedom, their fine culture, their independence, against the pitiless attack of undeclared war. Will these people win? They believe they can. They say it may take them 10 years or more, and they fully realize the suffering they will have to endure. But they have weapons to fight with, and they understand why they are fighting. And in the end, those are the things that mean victory.